Camera's all at five, four, three, two. Now, students, it's important you know current events. You did study this. I want you to come up here and explain who these people are. First of all, who is Ruben Salazar? Amy? For the LA Times, he was shot dead by a sheriff for writing a story about the Chicanos. He will be remembered for writing a story about the Mexican-American civil rights movement. Who, who is David Sanchez? Cassandra? David Sanchez was the founder of the Brown Beret. He fought for better schools. He also organized the youth and fought for civil rights. Today, he's still alive. Viva la raza. Hello everyone. Today we are here at the Mexican American University and uh, I'm going to briefly talk about this video that we're making. It's very important to know the history, the Chicago history, and also the history of our education system, educational system. It's very important to know that during the 1968 walkouts in East Los Angeles, everybody's taking credit for the walkouts, but in, in actuality, it was the Brown Berets that walked out the first schools uh, during the walkouts. Uh, the Brown Berry Coffee House was just down the street from Garfield High School. And so myself and several of the Brown Berets went over to the high school to walk the school out. A lot of people do not realize that we actually were the organization, only organization that had the ability uh, to pull off the walkouts because we had 15 Brown Berets at the time. And we also had like 10 students in the high schools. Well, a lot of our brothers and sisters were in the high schools. And so that's why it's important to understand. Viva la raza. Today we are celebrating the 1968 school walkouts. A lot of people don't really know what happened during the 1968 walkouts, but it was a time where there was a cultural, social, nonviolent, peaceful, social revolution going on in the United States. And it was a time for Chicanos to come out. And the walkouts in 1968 certainly sparked off the Chicano movement. Today the Chicano movement continues. And the way it continues is because the Brown Braves were actually the first ones on the set to walk out the schools. A lot of your conservative scholars do not give credit to the Brown Braves, but it was actually the Brown Braves that walked out the first high schools uh, during the walkouts. The first high schools where it walked out was Garfield High School, which was down the street from the Piranha Coffee House, or the Brown Brave Piranha Coffee House, was the first school to walk out. And then we walked out uh, Roosevelt High School. So, the, so once the first two schools were walked out, then uh, all the other schools walked out uh, th throughout Los Angeles and also throughout the, throughout the country. So that's why it's so important uh, to understand how this movement began, began to uh, do cause a domino effect, making schools to walk out and to make demands across the nation. And that's why it's important to understand that so many scholars, conservative scholars, refused to give the Brown Braves credit, but it was the Brown Braves that started the 1968 school walkouts. Now students, it's important you know current events. You did study this. I want you to come up here and explain who these people are. First of all, who is Ruben Salazar? Amy? Ruben Salazar was a reporter for the LA Times. He was shot dead by a sheriff for writing a story about the Chicanos. He will be remembered for writing a story about the Mexican-American civil rights movement. Who is David Sanchez? Cassandra? David Sanchez was the founder of the Brown Barrettes. He fought for better schools. He also organized the youth and fought for our civil rights. Today he's still alive. Viva la raza. Okay, that's good.
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Mexican American University, located here in Maywood. Maywood is just east of East LA. Anyway, we're, we can't. We're we came out here to uh, talk about what's happening. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Mexican American University here in Maywood, California, which is near East Los Angeles. I'd like to recognize uh, Nativo in the audience from the Mexican American uh, Political Association. Uh, I also would like to uh, recognize Augustine Serrada from, from the Brown Bray National Party, uh, and also Maria from the news. Anyway, it's very important uh, that we be here to remember, we are here to remember what really happened during the 1968 walkouts. And that's why we've come here today to, to establish this panel to discuss uh, some of the things that did occur. Uh, we have several guests here today. Uh, we're happy to have Dr. John Flores uh, to my left, and also uh, Dr. Vihi, who's also here uh, to discuss the 1968 walkouts. The 1968 walkouts was a very important event. It actually sparked the Mexican American movement or the Chicano movement, uh, and the walkouts continued from Los Angeles all across the country. So it's important to understand how the movement science behind the walkouts, and we're kind of here to talk about the movement science, but we're also here to talk about what actually occurred uh, during the walkouts in 1968. Uh, First of all, I'd like to, uh, John Fernandez, with each of us will have two minutes opening statements, and then we'll go to a further discussion. So do Dr. Uh, Fernandez, John Fernandez. Yeah, thank you very much, 68 uh, East LA Student Walkouts. I was a senior at Abraham Lincoln High School. And basically, the, I'm gonna talk about some of the conditions there at the school, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the problems that uh, are some of them which are new problems that are affecting the schools. So those are the two uh, aspects that I want to talk about, you know, being the senior and how also the walkouts, uh, that legacy or the walkouts changed me, you know, uh, from being uh, tracked into uh, uh, shop classes and stuff like that, and then how it changed me and how it inspired me to go to school and how it opened the doors for me to later become uh, a teacher teaching uh, uh, 31 years, 24 years at Roosevelt High School, becoming the director of the Mexican American Education Commission for the LA uh, Unified School District, and then also uh, obtaining a PhD uh, from UCLA in education. It was all because of the walkouts and how they changed me, not only me, but a lot of other students. Thank you, David, for inviting me here. My name is Diego Wehid. I'm a retired professor from UC Irvine. Uh, the walkouts were extremely significant, not just for me personally, but also for other people throughout the Southwest. In Norwalk, where I was a high school teacher, we didn't walk out at 68. But thanks to my nephew, Nativo, and his brother, they organized one three years later when Roosevelt had their second walkout. That's when uh, Excelsior High School in Norwalk took off. I'd like to add that my brother was one of the LA 13, uh, and I'm sure David invited me here in part for that, but also the fact that I knew the Berets before they were Berets at the United Coffee House. And this braid that I'm wearing was passed out 50 years ago by David in the first box he brought had of Berets. And he passed them out to all the people who would hang out at the Miranda. Now, the walkouts in 68 are well remembered. What is not, what is not uh, recognized by many people is that they had a similar experience a year after at the Biltmore Hotel when Governor Reagan was speaking at a conference. That walkout arrested 14 people. So I always think of the walkouts of 68 of uh, two years, 68 and 69. Education was a focal interest for our population. And we're still having difficulties with education. Even though there's been tremendous improvements, there's still poor counseling, 
advice uh, the counselors give students. There's still a lot of testing that weeds out a very uh, strong, intelligent student, but testing is supposed to be, it's a cultural thing. It's not an intellectual thing. If you come from the culture that makes up the test, that affects you. Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of issues related to what the walkouts were all about and <clears throat> how we had some improvements, some areas that were ignored, and still a long way to go for a number of other areas. Okay, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I know of back and forth until we finally come to the conclusion and then we open up for questions in a short time. Uh, we're they're having a party next door, so you have to uh, forgive us for that. Uh, we are here in, in the back uh, yard of the Mexican American University, and uh, we, we, we are accepting donations so we can get a better building. We don't have to be intense. But also, I think uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize the uh, Community Beacon uh, newspaper, Community Beacon. They're also here. I think we have to remember that there were a lot of scholars who documented the walkouts, but somehow they excluded the, the Brown Berets. Uh, and I'm here to say that I was there at the walkouts. I was arrested, one of the 13 who was arrested for the Chicano walkouts. They wanted to give us 66 years for conspiracy to disrupt the schools. Nonetheless, it was the walkouts uh, would not have happened, literally. They would not have happened. There would be no walkouts in 1968 if it hadn't been for the Brown Berets at the Piranha Coffee House. At the Piranha Coffee House, uh, with my dream when I was in high school to establish a coffee house in East LA, and when I was when I graduated from uh, Roosevelt High School, uh, I was granted. Uh, I was I received a grant to open a coffee house, and at least they paid the rent for at least one year. Uh, there, at the coffee house, uh, the brown berets were founded. Uh, basically, uh, I was the first one to wear a brown beret. Uh, and, and it became a good name for the organization. And so we made our old organization was Young Chicanos for Community Action. I said, let's just change the name to Brown Braves and everybody kind of agreed and that's what occurred. Uh, from that point on, we continued to organize the community, organize students. Uh, we had a number of, of uh, students who were involved. A number of Brown Braves were actually students in the high schools. And that's, that gave us our, our link into the high schools along with sending Brown Braves to walk out the schools. Uh, the first schools that walked out was Garfield. And the reason why Garfield walked out because uh, Wilson had walked out, like something like 30 students from Wilson had walked out on a Friday. And that gave us the news that it was hot. People were willing to accept it. Uh, we kind of jumped the gun because we had already planned ahead for the walkouts to be in June. Yet, we felt that June was too late and because 30 students walked out at Wilson High School. We felt that this was the spontaneity that we needed to walk out all the high schools. And because our brothers and sisters were at Roosevelt and Garfield, uh, we decided first to go out uh, to walk out uh, Garfield High School, which was the first high school to walk out. Uh, and then that was very successful. It made national news. And the next day, uh, we walked out uh, Roosevelt High School. And that also made national news. So we had like five days of national news as a result of the Brown Braves going out there and sparking the walkouts and making, uh, making the schools go out. It was not an easy task, uh, but it was a task that had to be done. Some of the Brown Braves knew that we were facing possible prison time. The courts did arrest us later, and they did try to give us 66 years, which is a lifetime. They wanted to give us a lifetime uh, for protesting. Uh, but in courts, it was decided that we had the right to protest and because of that they dropped the case and we were able to uh, be free uh, from the walkouts and be free from the courts. Uh, oh, by the way, my name is Dr. David Sanchez and uh, next to me, John Fernandez, you, two minutes. Some of the historic, uh, I guess some of the, the history uh, of why the students at uh, the five schools walked out. Uh, many people don't know that history. 
and they will begin by talking about you know Lincoln High School and Roosevelt and the problems that we encountered then but actually there's a very very important historical basis of the oppression and the uh, discrimination uh, in California and that that has to start California became uh, a state in 1850 the LA Unified School District became the LA Unified District or the LA City Schools District in 1853. Now you have to remember that the war between the US and Mexico, you know, uh, ended in 1848. So you have, just in the, within a few years, the establishment of a school system, okay, and then you have also discrimination in the schools and segregation starting in about 1861 in California. In 1861, they were already, uh, they were referring to Asians as Mongolians. They were discriminating against uh, African Americans and blacks, and they were discriminating against Indians. The discrimination was not really specific into, uh, you know, towards Mexican Americans, because we felt they, they saw, viewed us as Indians, okay? And it wasn't really written, but we were products or uh, we were being discriminated in segregated classes and segregated schools. And then also we had, we were uh, also being uh, hurt by racist IQ tests. So discrimination, racist IQ tests were eventually would catch up with us. And then also we were also part of what they termed Mexican schools or industrial schools also where they had a lot of shop classes and where the girls were going into home ec and they were going into secretarial classes, uh, business classes, and the, and, and the boys were uh, tracked into this industrial arts. But the underpinnings, the root, the root is in the, legi in the legislation that uh, if, if, if uh, the public schools allowed Mexican students, Mongolians is what they were terming the Asians, and Indians into these schools, they would actually take their funding away. So there's a basis there long before the walkouts. And I'll talk a little bit about that after. The walkouts, again, took place over several days, <clears throat> but repercussions throughout the Southwest were significant. As David said, it became the signature for Los Angeles' contribution to the movement. Because up to that time, Cesar Chavez had gotten a lot of support for good reasons. Farm workers, a lot of people came from that background. Reyes Lopez de Lima blew me away when the front pages of the LA Times covered how he took over land in New Mexico. Land that once belonged to the people. A communal land grant. And then Corky Gonzalez being part of the war on poverty, continued in spreading the idea of economic enterprises and business goals for the population. And the walkouts again affected education here, but throughout the Southwest, a lot of other schools repeated that. I even heard stories back then that there was a kindergarten walkout uh, that brought uh, kids to be politicized very young. And the complications with the educational system as John pointed out, we're overwhelming. How they had segregation, discrimination, isolation. I mean, it was just embarrassing. The idea of having separate, unequal schools, not enough chairs for all the students, not enough books or adequate books, even old books that were written uh, several years or decade, decade or two before. So the situation was such that there was a lot of things to overcome. And I said earlier, and I'll repeat it and underscore the point again, a lot of things still need to be done. At UC Irvine, where I had my last teaching job, 25% of the students are now Latinos, Latino American. That's a tremendous inroad. UC Santa Barbara, UC Riverside are also targeted to be uh, Latino <coughs> schools because of the population we have and the fact that our students are doing much better because of the walkouts. Those changes would not have been made unless the 
the educational system was shook up. And in the Biltmore, I know for a fact, when we had our, our demonstration a year after the walkouts, Governor Reagan was speaking to 500 educators that were teaching in, in Hispanic schools. And that blew everybody away and made the front pages of the newspapers. And Reagan and his political uh, network of the Republicans, conservatives, went after not just us, but went after other kinds of people that were known as rabble-rousers rabble in the schools. And people just questioning, hey, the IQ test you have is for English speakers. Do you have one in Spanish? There's no, if you can't speak uh, English, we, we have to, you have to go on the basis of this score. So things like that were being conducted on a regular basis. Things have not improved that much. Definitely some improvements. Definitely an improvement in the dropout rates, but from what John tells me, those those uh, figures, they play around with them to make them look good. Yes, I think uh, you have to realize the, the power that we have in our community. The Mexican-American, for, for example, the Mexican-American is a national minority recognized uh, by the United Nations. The Aboriginal name for the Mexican-American is Chicano. Uh, nonetheless, over the years, the government and the schools, or the schools being used by the government uh, to oppress this powerful potential force. And that is the Chicano, that is the Mexican American. Uh, over the years, they've defeated many of our young people and they continue to terrorize many of our students throughout uh, with too much homework, too much testing, too much uh, of, of, of academics. Uh, push down their throat uh, more than they can consume or, or, or want to take in. Uh, they do this for the reason to defeat students. Many of our students have been defeated by this system. It's obvious if you just look at the dropout rates in our schools. Even also, not only the dropout rates in our schools, but also the dropout rates in our colleges and universities. For example, we have a large number of students going to East Los Angeles College, but a very small amount of students actually graduating. The terrorism that goes on in our schools today, and the terrorism that goes on in our schools in the past, is unbelievable. All of the things that are applied to the mind to erase the mind or to cause defeat of our students. And this is why we've decided to look toward creating our own university, the Mexican-American University, because we need to create our own institution. If we continue to depend on white institutions to educate our children, what do we get? We get people who are, just want to take advantage of our people. And we, we need to get away with that. We need to create institutions that are for the people, that are for the community. Also, I'd like to give special thanks to the Brown Bray National Party, who's here. Uh, they also are part of building the Mexican American University, and I hope that all of you can take part in building this university. If you look at it, and the reality is that today, the African Americans have 17 colleges and colleges and universities. The Native Americans, the Indians, have six universities. The Mexican American, which consists of 40 million people, the Mexican American, which consists of four million students in the state of California, we do not have one university that we can call our own. And this is why we need to take steps so we can create the new leaders who will come forward and assist our empowerment, to assist us to become great in our communities, to assist us to create new leaders. So far, most of the people that go to the colleges and universities, they do not come back to the community. They do not come back as leaders. And that's why it's so important that we create a university that will create a new leadership, a Chicano leadership, a Mexican-American leadership. It's so needed, and it's needed today. Uh, Dr. Fernandez? Yeah, I mentioned the, uh, about 1861 in California when the legislature had laws segregating Mexican students, the, uh, Indians, Native Americans, uh, African Americans, and the Asians, which they call at that time Mongolians, and if they were to go to school, public schools, with white students, they would lose their funding. Well, those laws 
uh, changed for about 20, 30 years. They were constantly changing the laws, and in some cases, they would allow uh, the students uh, of color in. In some cases, they weren't. They, they kept on changing. The, it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and they would use all kind of arguments, you know, that they were disease-ridden, that they were uh, delinquents, that they're, you know, the biggest arguments, of course, were the, the, the uh, uh, hereditary or that we were innately inferior biologically uh, to white students. And that, you know, so these tests kept coming on and then finally uh, they eliminated these group tests. They were actually testing as a group. But one of the biggest uh, uh, developments was the Mendez decision that outlawed segregation in Westminster, California in 1940, uh, I think it was 46 or 47. But don't be fooled, because after, uh, you know, after the gringos uh, uh, ended, uh, you know, in California ended segregation, they then start, they started a thing called de facto segregation, which meant that the laws were not really in the books anymore in terms of IQ testing and the policies, but then they were doing it, you know, kind of under the radar, and they call it de facto segregation. And then the Crawford decision in 18, uh, in 1983, basically ended that de facto segregation. So you're talking about segregation in the 1861-62, all the way to 1983, really, that many years of segregated schooling. So then, then we have also the racist IQ test which for the most part have been eliminated, but we then had a thing called the Americanization process in the early 1900s where they wanted to Americanize all the foreigners. They wanted to American, force them to learn English, the American way and so forth. Uh, and so anyhow, they used that also, Americaniz the Americanization process. And the schools like LA, uh, you know, unified, and the LA City Schools, they put tons of money to the Americanization process to eliminate any Spanish, uh, to make you, to assimilate you into an American. Okay, so then, uh, then after that, they also had in the curriculum, they started with the industrial classes, the shop classes, the, the, the you know, upholstery shop, metal shop, wood shop, auto shop. There were so many shop classes, and the girls were being tracked into into these uh, you know home ec classes learning how to cook and how to sew and in fact they were not just doing it in the high schools they were doing it in elementary elementary schools already tracking the 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 the, the latinas the mexican students how to sew and cook and taking these home ec classes so they were doing it very early and in la unified they were doing it because they felt if they could change the Latina, the Mexicana, they could change her culturally. They could change the, the, the male students and everyone else if they focused on sending her you know, to the home ec classes, the cooking classes. They felt that the carrier, the transmitter of culture was the Latina. So then you had schools then at that time also being called Mexican schools or industrial schools, Garfield, Lincoln, Rosa, they were called industrial schools because they emphasized shop classes, okay? Those, most of those classes now are, have been eliminated, but they were calling them industrial schools and Mexican schools. So the, the, the next round, I'm gonna start talking about the conditions at Abraham Lincoln High School where I met, but I wanted to give you a historical, you know, uh, uh, perspective. You know, this thing, you know, in, in the book that I'm just about ready to finish, my, my thing, my perspective is race. I use a lot of race, not just class. I use a lot of race, and I also, in and I start with Columbus. I'm not gonna start right here with Columbus, but I'm just letting you know, this thing is about race, and it starts, you know, when Columbus lands in the Bahamas, you know, in 1492. This thing goes back all the way, and most Chicano scholars, they start in 1848. I don't start in 1848. I start at the beginning where it really started. One of the things that happened school in Los Angeles, I went to San Pedro Elementary and John Adams Junior High. And then my parents moved to suburbia, different story there at Norwalk. But one of the things that happened to me, when I used to read the books, 
the history books, even in elementary school, but especially in junior high. Maybe a short paragraph like this. <laughs>